what's better than bringing up the Piat? Bringing up more than a dozen of them at once. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. Today we're going to be looking at the Piat Universal Carrier, an infield adaptation created by the Royal Canadian Engineers. The 16th Field Company of the Royal Canadian Engineers was attached to the 3rd Canadian Division during operations in Northwest Europe. Each Canadian division had a divisional Royal Canadian Engineers group attached to it, made up of several field companies. In late 1944, the 16th Field Company RCE was located near Nijmegen in the Netherlands. The 16th Field Company embarked on a series of experiments after their division's commander, Major General Daniel Spry, put out a directive calling for harassing weapons to be developed. The interesting adaptation we're looking at today came about in November, December 1944, when the 16th Field Company, RCE, outfitted a universal carrier with a battery of projector infantry anti-tanks, the British and Commonwealth Infantry Anti-Tank Weapon. The unusual experimental setup is somewhat reminiscent of a miniature Soviet Katusha rocket launcher or Commonwealth land mattress. While the Piat carrier is similar in concept to both of these multiple rocket launcher systems, we have to remember that the Piat isn't a rocket launcher, it's a spigot mortar. The Canadian engineers mounted the Piats in two rows at an obtuse angle at the rear of the universal carrier, presumably for use in a limited bombardment role. The idea behind outfitting the carrier appears to have been to utilise the Piat in its secondary indirect role as a mortar, perhaps to fire against buildings or harass enemy positions. From photographs taken in the field, we can see that the engineers of the 16th Field Company fixed the Piats into a wooden frame at the rear of the carrier. They appear to have had their monopods removed, but some still appear to have their slings fitted. From further research and some digging through the 16th Field Company's war diaries, I found the original reports on the adapted carrier and even some diagrams showing how the bombs landed. The diaries also reveal that the Universal Carrier was not the first vehicle the Piats were mounted on. The first tests with the system were actually carried out from the back of a truck. In the war diary, we get our first mention of the Piat battery in an entry on the 15th of November 1944, which reads... The GOC, General Officer Commanding, directed that each arm of the service should be prepared to devise some means of harassing the enemy of the division's present area and to act as a countermeasure to the Moaning Minis employed by the Germans. The Moaning Mini was one of the Western Allies' nicknames for the German Nebelwerfer, a multiple rocket launching system, known for its shrill deafening shriek when fired. It was decided that the sappers would make use of the 24 Piats held by the Divisional Engineer Group. The tentative idea being that these be mounted on a vehicle or two vehicles, that they could be fired mechanically and possibly simultaneously with a multiple mortar effect. Lieutenant Cameron and Number 1 Platoon were given the task, experiments to be carried out tomorrow. For this purpose, all piats and ammunition were called into this company from the Divisional Engineering Group. The next day, on the 16th of November, the diary recorded... Lieutenant Cameron made a number of tests with his Piat platoon and found that the maximum range that could be attained was 300 yards. Then, several days later, on the 19th of November, Lieutenant Cameron gave a demonstration of the capabilities of the Piat. 18 Piats were mounted in racks on one vehicle at an angle of 45 degrees and fired simultaneously. There was no jar to the vehicle. Max range obtained was 300 yards against the wind and 400 yards with the wind. Detonation of the salvo was all within one second and covered an area 25 feet in length by 15 feet width. This short report concluded by explaining why the mobile Piat battery may not have been practical in the field, noting that the plan is not practicable at present as areas of firing are not available that would permit the vehicle moving up to 300 yards from the target before firing. The first test is described in a report dated the 21st of November. A total of 22 Piats were available to Lieutenant Cameron's platoon. They mounted 18 of these in racks on the bed of a Ford Canada 3-ton truck, likely an F-60. The remaining four were held in reserve as spares. The report explains 
that steel wasn't available, so wood was used for the racks. They also believed that the wood would have a cushioning effect, serving to shield the truck from the shock of recoil. The 18 piats were arranged in three rows of six piats, with the piats spaced one foot apart next to one another, with four feet spaced between each row. The piats were angled at a 45 degree angle, with the wooden frame attached to the side of the truck bed, with the butt of the weapons bolted down under wooden struts. To fire the weapons, rods were run along the rows aligned with the weapon's triggers, with bars of one and a half inch steel running back between each row and back towards the front of the truck where the operator was stationed, and the report describes this setup as satisfactory. In the first test, all three rows of piats were fired at the same time. The report's findings note that in the first test, all but one of the weapons fired. The bombs were in the air for an estimated four to five seconds, and the time between the first and last bomb striking the ground was approximately half a second to one second. The blast radius of the bombs was noted as five feet, with six to nine inches of penetration into the area's sandy loam soil. The range was found to be 310 yards against the wind and 400 yards with it. The wind was noted to be traveling at 20 to 25 miles per hour. From the diagrams accompanying the report, we can see that the beaten zone had a maximum diameter of approximately 54 to 60 feet, and with a mean point of impact around 15 to 18 feet wide. The second test saw all of the Piats fire properly, with the sappers firing two full salvos to test how quickly the rig could be reloaded. The reload time between salvos was recorded at 1 minute 20 seconds. The second salvo saw six of the Piats fail to fire due to a mechanical failure with one of the trigger rods. The extreme range achieved during this second firing was 420 yards with the assistance of the wind. During the first field test of the truck mounted system, 65 bombs were fired and only one failed to explode downrange. The racks were strengthened and the trigger rod was repaired. It was also concluded that the racks could be spaced closer together without affecting the pattern of the beaten zone downrange. There's no further mention of the testing in the war diary during November, but progress definitely appears to have been made, with an entry on the 15th of December noting, the use of piats mounted on a vehicle has had further experimental trials. 15 piats have been mounted on a Bren carrier, and a trial shoot was held today. Against a slight wind, a range of 310 yards was attained, with an area of burst covering 25 feet deep and 50 feet wide. No recoil was felt in the carrier. The very last mention of the piat carrier comes on the 30th of December. The carrier mounted with 15 piats was on trial during the afternoon before an audience consisting of the GOC and officers of the division. All visitors were impressed by the display. A range of 350 yards was attained and accuracy on target was good. It would seem that it was believed that the idea held promise if it was being demonstrated to the commanding officer of the division, but there are no further mentions of the piat carrier in the diary. Excuse this brief interruption guys, I just wanted to ask you to make sure you're subscribed to the channel and that you've hit the notification bell to make sure that you don't miss future videos. We need all the help we can get to overcome YouTube's algorithms, so please drop us a like and if you have any questions about the video, please leave us a comment and we'll happily answer them. This all helps new people discover our videos. Similarly, as I always say, please share the videos with friends. Tab owes many of our viewers to those who share the videos on social media, in forums, and with anyone who might be interested. Tab is an entirely viewer-supported project, so if you'd like to support the channel further, check out the links in the description box below. And don't forget to follow us over on our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. Right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. It seems that the development of the idea didn't progress into 1945. By early February, the 16th Field Company were involved in Operation Veritable. It appears that the operational requirement no longer existed. Let's take a closer look at how the adaptation was done. From the available photos, which were probably taken in mid-December 1944, we can see the trigger bar that was passed through the trigger guards of each of the Piats. 
with the bar resting on the base of the trigger. It's unclear from the available photographs, but this may have allowed the weapons to be fired either by row or altogether. The sappers have built a wooden platform onto the back of the carrier, with welded metal brackets holding the pieces in place. The piazza are held between two wooden cross pieces that have been bolted together. There's a strip of metal running around the edge of the wooden frame that has been twisted 90 degrees and then welded to the carrier. It's also worth noting that all of the piats have had their butt pad covers removed and the feet of the piats rear end caps have been secured by a pair of brackets either side. We can also see in this photo that the carrier has a crooked allied star. These white stars were painted at an angle to differentiate Commonwealth vehicles from US vehicles whose allied stars were aligned with their top point at 12 o'clock. It appears that the battery of Piat's was aimed by reversing the carrier towards its target. That would certainly have been challenging and a fairly dangerous task given the relatively short range of the Piat, even when used as a light mortar. The series of photographs were taken in the field near Nijmegen. From this photograph we can see a Canadian sapper loading the Piat's. The sapper is loading the bomb from the front of the bomb support tray and appears to have angled the tail up to slide the projectile loading clip into the projectile clip guide. Interestingly, we can see all of the spigot tube stoppers dangling on their chains. In this next shot, we see all of the piats held in their racks, with their sights folded down, but their slings still attached. And we also get a good view of the white indirect fire aiming lines painted along the top of the piat. At the bottom of the photo, we can see the trigger bar which appears to pull the triggers of the whole row at once. In this photograph we see sappers preparing the battery to fire, with the sapper in the foreground removing bombs from three Piat bomb carriers. While in the background on the right we can see another sapper carrying bombs forward from another set of bomb carriers. I would guess that it was perhaps decided to mount 15 Piats rather than an even number, as the bomb carriers held three rounds each. So for ease of loading, it was known that five full bomb carriers would be needed to reload the battery of Piat's. It appears that sandbags are being used as a counterweight at the front of the carrier. The combined weight of the Piat's and their bombs, which was about 555 pounds, as well as the weight of the frame, would have been considerable. While sadly we don't have any footage of the test, we're lucky to have this selection of brilliant photographs, courtesy of Library and Archives Canada. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this look at an innovative field expedient adaptation that brought together two classic pieces of British and Commonwealth kit, the Piat and the Universal Carrier. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Sharing the video with friends really helps us get the word out about the channel. You can also find an in-depth article to accompany this video over on our website www.armorersbench.com. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.